Well, hello, everyone. Phil Giuliani here again. And this program is One in Messiah here on LAM Network. And it's always great to be here. Uh, today, we have um, a little different program. Uh, I'm not going to be doing a teaching, not going to be showing a PowerPoint. Uh, but we will have a guest on very shortly. And if you remember, uh, uh, two weeks ago, we had Paul Wilbur here as a guest. And we did the program and didn't really finish up all we wanted to do. So we're going to try to get him on again sometime soon to do uh, part two. Today, we're going to have another guest who um, told me that he was going to be a little bit late, and that's fine. Uh, he's not here yet but as soon as he comes he's going to be on the program and just to cut the suspense the guest we're going to have is nathan wilbur and yes they are related nathan is paul's son as you might know he has two sons nathan and joel and they are all very good friends of mine and uh, my wife and I feel like we've been part of their family for a long time, and we love going down to Jacksonville, Florida, to to hang out. And when we go for the board meeting, we get to spend two or three days, and uh, it's just always a good time. And not to mention other people who are known in the Messianic community, who we also get to see when we're there for the board meeting. So Nathan's going to be joining us. We're going to talk a little bit about his father and family, although I don't want to put the emphasis on that. I want him to tell us what he's doing in his own ministries and in his own right and what his plans are for the future and that sort of thing, and without putting him on the spot. And so it's always great to be here on LAM Network. And um, as I said, um, um, a few days ago at um, the conference that we streamed here uh, called Called Out, Being the Body of Mashiach. I hope you had the opportunity to see that. Um, it was put on by Basora Institute, which is here in the Cleveland area, and was streamed all day. And when I mean all day, I mean from about 10 30 a.m till 10 p.m it was quite a long day but we had some great teachings and some great music and i hope you caught some of that uh i think if you go on the lamb tv site uh it is there um because i watched parts of it again the following day it was on sunday november 13th so uh if um on my own YouTube channel, I put the teaching that I did about the call to discipleship. And it was basically about the cost of discipleship. And discipleship is not always an easy thing. As it has become, you know, in our time, where we have what I always call easy Christianity. So uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, which is One in Messiah, Gift of Grace Ministries, you can watch that. And our guest has just popped into the green room. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> We're going to bring him on. And here he is, Nathan Wilbur. I already, I, I spoiled the surprise by telling everybody it was you that was coming in. Well, thank so you. So welcome. It's good to can be here with okay? you. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yes. I can hear you loud and clear. Great. So, great to have you here. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Messianic Lamb Network, but it is uh, at lambnetwork.tv, and it's on, I don't think continuously, but from early morning till late at night, and there's various teachers, various different kinds of shows, and I already my audience is already breathing a sigh of relief because I said, I'm not going to be doing a teaching today <laughs> <laughs> so they can relax. And I already mentioned that two weeks ago, we had your father, Paul Wilbur here. 
And I also said that when you got here, we were going to just have kind of a interview conversation, but I didn't want the whole conversation to be about you being Paul Wilbur's son. I want to talk <laughs> about you in your own right. Oh, and so you. it's great to have you here. And before we get started, I should point out that I've known Nathan and his brother, Joel, since, I don't know, you guys were teenagers. And they both started calling me Uncle Phil when they were pretty young. And then Nathan's son, Caleb, who called me Uncle Phil and even named a stuffed shark after me. <laughs> I was very honored. I always ask them how Uncle Phil the shark is. but And now there's new babies in the family. That That's right. I haven't formally met yet. <laughs> but so, Nathan, where should we start? Well, Ooh. a lot of people find it fascinating that I know Dr. Phil. <laughs> uh, and that he's on our board and like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> like, well, maybe not the Dr. Phil you're thinking about. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. we've, I can remember the, the visits to Ohio showing up to a church, you know, the snow on the, on the ground. And you would always be the first person right there to greet and say, Hey, <laughs> and my dad would say, you know, he drove eight hours to be here. <laughs> <laughs> And so just yeah. getting to know you over all the years and um, you love the Lord first and foremost and your family. And so it's a privilege to be on here with you. I count it a joy. I really enjoy getting to share my story. And yeah. It's not something that gets often told. It's usually we delve into the, the scriptures, right? Yes. And we tell those stories. Yes. But. But it's good to have personal stories, you know. It's and exactly. you know when you when you're you've had a lot of experiences that you know most young men your age haven't had. <laughs> for better so, and for worse. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, down in Jacksonville, I'm sure the weather is better than it is here, where it's about mm -hmm. 35 degrees and rain mixed with snow and very windy and just a pleasant day in Northern Ohio. <laughs> yeah. I think we peaked at 60, which here is pretty chilly. Oh yeah. So people are wearing jackets and sweatshirts. Oh, pretty rough. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's tough to be in Florida, but yeah. Yeah. So why don't you tell everybody about your family because you have such an awesome family. We just love your family. Your, yeah, I you mean, know, your immediate family. In my travels, it's very rare when you hear uh, family ministry, family business. Those two aren't usually put together because family can be a blessing, but also divisive. But I think coming from my background with seeing my dad, I just want to thank him for honoring the Lord first. You know, it, seeing him demonstrate what it means to be a follower isn't just something that he does on stage. It's his lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And the same person that shows up early to sound check, to lead people into worship, to pray for them, to cry, to laugh with them after to hear their stories and spend time. You know, that's one thing that I don't typically see that happens in even the church world, let mm -hmm. alone the secular world, when people want to see an artist you know, that they're like, oh, I want to go to that concert, hear that person. And then I want to experience what they're like backstage. You know, my dad brings the backstage to the front <laughs> and is always he's usually the last person standing. Yeah. And I'm usually the one that was trying to guide him. OK, dad, it's midnight and uh, we have to get up at five to catch our flight yeah. to go to another city or to go home. But, you know, he came with that same energy at home when uh loving us, me and my brother, and didn't want me to be in ministry, not because he didn't want me to serve with him, but wanted me to find out my calling. And so I have mm -hmm. a lot of respect when I came home, listing the element that I wanted to be when I grew up, my dad's like, no, fine, do something yeah. else. Go, go have an adventure, find out <laughs> who God is and experience him for yourself. And of course he did the good fatherly discipline, teaching me the ways of the Lord. But there's something different when you know personally who he is, what he's done for you, that you can't 
teach. It has mm -hmm. to come through experience. Mm -hmm. But my dad loved me through all those uh, years. I didn't really have very many difficult ones. For me, I felt like if my dad frowned, that was worse than being corrected uh, in any other way. So uh, I really tried to live my life wholeheartedly serving the Lord and everything I did, everything I said. And I, I'm not perfect by any means. I'm just, I'm human like everybody else. <laughs> but I have a desire maybe beyond other people to see the light of Messiah shine through me so that other people can see who he is through me and what I've experienced. And hopefully from coming in contact with me, they would say whatever he's doing or whomever he's worshiping, that's what I want to do with my life mm -hmm. as well. And so I, I really see this expression of Exodus 34, where we see um, the characteristics of God. And when we see the characteristics of God, shining through the ironic blessing and that's what's happening when he places his name upon us how we're supposed to act and behave you know if we all did that and we're true to his identity we'd be in a lot different world but alas um, <coughs> the times are getting darker but i just decided you know to be a bright light and i did go on a wild adventure my dad uh even helped pay for it <laughs> you know in my schooling but it's you know, it's a true testament of, I think, the man that you may experience for some of you. Maybe you haven't been in a worship experience with my dad, but the same person that spends the time at the end of the services is also the same person um, at home. Just loved my mom unconditionally and uh, faithful to her and to us, to my brother and myself. Mm -hmm. And it's been, I literally, tell people i've been in ministry for 40 years i'm 41 <laughs> but i don't know i don't know my life outside of this life yeah. you know it's it's been in ministry and then me personally i've been in ministry for 20 years myself mm -hmm. and uh it's it's been wild it's mm -hmm. been a good time well when he was here two weeks ago i told him that um when i was a brand new believer because when i became a believer i was in my mid 40s so mm. i wasn't like you i was you know <laughs> mid 40s and i bought the shalom jerusalem cd oh i love that one yes and i didn't know anything at all about messianic music and in fact i had gone to the store to buy vineyard music and whatever else mm. and um i'd started going to a vineyard church and i was looking for more music and the uh, young lady who was working at the cashier, um, at the checkout place, she saw me looking mm -hmm. at Shalom Jerusalem. And I was intrigued by the sort of Hebrew look mm -hmm. to it. Which and was upside said, down, by the way. Yeah, it's, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Nobody really knows yeah. that. And on and, the and album, this, they Yeah, and this young lady said to me, <laughs> once if you play this CD, you won't, you'll, you'll just play it over and over again. Wow. So I said, okay. So I bought it and I played it over and over again. But what you were saying, as you were saying your remarks there, one thing I realized when I first saw him in person, you know, listening to the CD is very powerful. And, you know, I was listening in my car and listening at home. And so, but in person, you knew right away that you were not there for a concert. Yeah, you were you knew right away that you weren't there to watch somebody perform, and then when they were done with a song, you would just politely clap. Then you would sit down, hear the next song. Yeah. It was a worship experience that mm -hmm. took everybody into it, mm -hmm. and I used to just like watching his mannerisms and his body language, and you could see that while he was doing the songs, he was worshiping the Lord. And he yeah. wasn't there as a musician. It wasn't there as a performer. Mm -hmm. He was really worshiping. And it was, it, I, I can't tell you what, what an effect it had on me. Mm -hmm. um, as a new believer, it was, it was, it was awesome. Yeah. There's and two then, elements. Uh, oh, and then when ahead. he, when he, you know, we, as you know, we started driving all over, you know, if he was within 500 miles, you know, we were there. <laughs> so and, true. You know, storefront churches and mega churches and 
little congregations and big congregations, you know, wherever it was. And that's how I met you and your brother. Because sometimes, you know, you would come along and mm -hmm. and then later you traveled with them more and more. And it, it, it was great. And the fact, I mean, we always joke about you calling me Uncle Phil, but I, it's just so nice for me. It's just such a nice connection to you guys mm -hmm. rather than you saying, oh, hey, you, how you doing? You know, nice to see you again. What's new? It's, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's a much more of a connection. And, you know, we were, we were honored to be at your wedding. We weren't at Joel's yeah. wedding, but we were at your wedding. <laughs> this and, was in uh, Pennsylvania. Not as I still Pennsylvania. remember how hot it was at your wedding. Whoa. And it was in the California desert, and it must have been 100 degrees, but it was hot. And when I, <laughs> I, I had not met Malky before, mm -hmm. and when I said to her, well, Nathan calls me Uncle Phil, and now that you guys are married, I want to be, I want to become your favorite uncle. And she kind of said, well, I don't know. You know, <laughs> I have a lot of uncles or something like that. Oh, and then does. about a couple of years later, she said, Uncle Phil, you're my favorite uncle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So tell us about Malky and your kids. So Malky, my wife, we met, um, we've been married 13 years. And it, it, it can be a long story. But... Uh, <laughs> I was, I was an adventurer, you know, I was out living in Israel. I was learning Hebrew. I thought it was time to make Aliyah, which means uh, to go up to make your citizenship as a, a Jewish person by birth. And I had that right mm -hmm. by way of my uh, grandfather and my dad. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, let's, let's be serious about this and go to Israel. I was there for about five months. And I had this powerful encounter from the Lord that I don't say very lightly, but he opened like this television in front of me. It was a vision. And he just spoke very plainly to me that I was supposed to go home and lift up my dad's arms in the ministry. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what connection that had with meeting my wife, because to me, they were synonymous, connected that I'll go to Israel, get citizenship, marry um an israeli and do what good jewish boys are supposed to in, <laughs> in the return but uh the lord had other plans and i faithfully came back to work with my dad in the ministry my dad pleaded with me are you sure this is what you want to do you really want to come back home and you want to work with me in the ministry i said dad god spoke and i can't tell him otherwise so i need to be obedient and it was pretty shortly when i came back that my wife Malky, this was back when MySpace was around. It wasn't Facebook mm -hmm. and Instagram and all these, you know, TikTok. I don't know what it would have been like for Malky and I to meet today. It probably would have been more on Facebook. That's what she, <laughs> the platform she chooses. But she just sent me a friend request because she uh, had met my dad and she was just, you know, intrigued by the family, loved the music. And we just started talking here and there. Her, her uh, rabbi, um, I call Uncle Renee. He started uh, uh, Israel's Hope with my dad back in the 80s. And I won't get into how all that started because we'll, we'll be here for an hour. Yeah. But you'll see in my life that the way God has always spoken to me and I've moved and done what he's asked is through relationship. I think relationship is pivotal and very important. But Malky's rabbi had been after me actually to meet Malky, but I didn't realize it was her. And so when I started putting those two elements together, I said, well, I need to meet you. So I came <laughs> out to California to the MJAA uh, Southeast Conference yeah, in yeah. Irvine, California. and the rest is kind of history. We were friends for three years. I didn't, I didn't jump right into it. My friends, including my brother, were like, "What's wrong with you? She's a beautiful girl, and <laughs> <laughs> she's everything that you wanted. You know, a Hispanic, Jewish. So just, you know, 
stop beating around the bush. Uh, but I wanted to be sure, you know, and God gave me that certainty that this is who I, I have for you. And Caleb, my firstborn, he came pretty quickly. So uh, that was, <laughs> you know, when I hit my 30s, uh, it was always something I asked the Lord. I said, I want to be married and I want to have my first son by the time I'm 30. And it's amazing mm -hmm. how I didn't navigate my life that way. It just kind of happened. And I look yeah. back and I was like, wow, God really fulfills your heart's desire. Even in a time frame where you, you know, you don't purposely try to do it that way. It just happened. Mm. And our second child was coming pretty quickly. Uh, but sadly we lost him and we, he went to heaven and, um, we went through a real dry season of our life in terms of having children. God was still doing amazing things through a ministry, through our family in ways that I can't even uh, speak to even now. I'd probably fill a book. Maybe that I'll write one day. Yes. But, you know, through a lot of tears and asking the Lord, uh, we want to have a bigger family. We want children. And nine years later, he answered that call. It was just one of those times where we had finally surrendered to the Lord. You know, it's not our will Let your will be done. We give up um, even our dreams to you. And I was, I was studying and getting ready for one of our Shabbat in your homes. You know, we do these virtual mm -hmm. gatherings around the table every Friday mm -hmm. on, um, on our platform, on uh, Facebook and YouTube <clears throat> with our whole family. And it was studying about the life of Noah. I know when the Lord's going to speak to me because the atmosphere in my room changes. Mm. It just shifts. And I can't explain er anything to you except I know that he's going to speak and I need to stop and be, and be silent. Mm -hmm. And he was very specific with me. He said, Malky will be pregnant soon. You will have a son and you're to name him Noah wow. because he's a sign that you've entered the last days. And it so uh, shook me. I said, in my mind, I remember saying, so you're saying that calling him Noah means we've entered the times of Noah? That's the way I was thinking. And I was bewildered. I literally stopped my studying. I walked downstairs. And Malky said, it looked like I had seen a ghost. Mm. She said, I was, uh, <laughs> she had, I had a bewildered look on my face. She came up to me. She said, what's wrong? Are you okay? I said, the Lord spoke to me and I told her what he had said. And she said immediately she connected her faith with what I said and said, let the Lord's will be done. Mm. And so a month and a half after that, two months, uh, we found out we were having, <coughs> um, the Malky was pregnant. And then everyone's like, ooh, is it a boy or girl? I said, it's a boy and his name is Noah. And they're like, wow. oh, did God tell you that? I said, actually, yeah. He did. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah. So Noah's a year and three months. And pretty and, soon. <laughs> and pretty soon we're going to have a third son. So you could say <laughs> that when God blesses you, you get with the overflow. <laughs> That's right. It's arrows in the quiver. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah. There's no absolutely. dolls around your house or Joel's house. <laughs> We've got Legos, cars, yeah. G.I. Joe's, and Nerf guns. <laughs> <laughs> and Uncle Phil the Shark. Oh, Uncle Phil the Shark. I <laughs> He is still there yeah. right next to Caleb. I was going through his stuffed animals by his bed last night. Mm -hmm. And he it's just funny to me. But Yeah. Wow. So when is your next son due? A couple months? The end of January or February. Wow. That's awesome. So by the time we come down for the board meeting, he'll be there. <laughs> yeah, that will be, what, like a month? Yeah, about, be a, about month. a month. Yeah. And a half old. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. That's wonderful. Great story. So how has, tell us how your ministry has been 
kind of evolving, what you've been doing? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a big question. You know, my dad has been the faithful leader of Wilbur Ministries for over 40 years of his mm -hmm. life. I think he's 47 years now. Wow. And you're a part of the board, so you know the whole question that was pushed and presented about five years ago. Paul, is Wilbur Ministries going to surpass your name and go beyond your time? Or is Wilbur Ministries just going to, you know, we'll help you retire. We'll close up the books and say that was a <laughs> job well done. And, you know, he, he'll never fully retire. I, no. I fully believe that he just, he loves what he does. And with today's technology, he's doing it online every Wednesday. Yeah. We call it Worship yeah. Wednesday. He goes live yes. on our Facebook and YouTube. Mm -hmm. And it, it's easy for him. He doesn't have to travel, but he still loves and has a passion to travel the nations. Yeah. Uh, he may not be doing it as much this coming year as he has been, but it, it's interesting because we're looking now for the children. For mm -hmm. me, I'm not a child, but <laughs> <laughs> the heirs yeah. of Paul Wilbur to carry on his legacy. And honestly, I couldn't be more uh, consider myself more privileged to be asked by um, the board first, but then also to my dad to say, Nathan, Joel, you know, Malky, Shay, is this do you want to carry on my legacy? He says, I'm not pushing anything on you. Uh, I'll help you find great jobs, do something else in life. Uh, we, we've had a good run as a family and we're still, we still love each other and have dinners together <laughs> all the time. And, and it's tough, right? You know, sometimes family can be your also worst enemy, but, family but in our it. house. Yeah. Yeah. But thankfully we work together. We love each other and we still have dinner together as a family. Wow. And all of us all of you have dinner together wow. unequivocally you know my brother is really my best friend i've <laughs> I, wow. i've learned in life that uh, locations can change and people can shift in and out um but the family that god has together if you can put pride aside and allow his love and his spirit to work through you in all the difficult things. Family is the closest thing that you're going to have to experiencing the father and what the, and what mm -hmm. we're going to experience one day in heaven. Mm -hmm. yes. And it should come through our households, through a healthy household experience. And it hasn't always been perfect. You know, we have our <laughs> disagreements. Uh, we're not an angelic. I would like yeah. to think we are. Yeah, I think yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we do handle what we do go through in difficult situations with the love of the lord because that's that's the right way to do it mm -hmm. but you know life hasn't been um the yellow brick road on um, um, yeah. wizard of oz or yeah. you know just paved with gold and yeah. everything's just like yeah. singing and la la galling yeah and, uh, la 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 <laughs> well, yeah well you know it's it's uh everywhere i teach and everywhere i go i always bring up the Christian life is not a 100 yard dash. It's not 9.9 .9 seconds and it's over. It's a long marathon mm -hmm. run. And sometimes you're running through a beautiful sunny field and it's 70 mm -hmm. degrees. And sometimes there's a thunderstorm going on and you fall into a puddle. And sometimes there's a blizzard comes up and you just mm -hmm. keep on going and you clean yourself off and then you keep going. Because, you know, just like the people wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, we're, want, yeah. we're all wandering through our own wildernesses. That's right. And like the writer to the Hebrews says, you know, they were heading to the physical promised land. We're mm -hmm. heading to the ultimate promised That's land. Right. But we all have a journey to do before that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I understand what you mean. There's no family is angelic. And I've never seen anybody with halos. And I've never... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have this thing going on with my hair right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> when I was your age, I was bald as I am now. <laughs> so, I told Malky I may just trim it all off. She's like, no, you have to keep it as long as you have your hair. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. It. Yeah. Wow, that's wonderful. And you've been preaching and teaching. Tell I actually about, get invitations 
to share on the word of God. It's become my greatest passion. When I was probably, I think I was three years old. There's a picture that my dad still has to this day where I'm sitting on a, on his telephone at his office where Israel's hope was. Uh-huh. And I was answering it. Uh-huh. And that, that picture's kind of always stuck in my mind. Uh-huh. So I always kind of had an affiliation with ministry right and as i started growing up in this uh you know i would always hear the rabbi preach from the the bima and think Mm -hmm. you know that's amazing how they can do that maybe one day i'll do something like that and Mm -hmm. i enjoyed getting in front of people and making them laugh yeah i always had a great uh i I really enjoy that so what i've seen how the lord has kind of built my character uh is being able to share his word in a way that can make it tangible for us today. You know, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, I feel my job in preaching and teaching his word is showing how it's never changed, never shifted. It's people that have diluted it and made it to no effect. They've tried to, but his word sustains through it all. And so when someone tries to tell me, well, the the ways of the bible don't pertain to today i'm just like you're going on dangerous territory yes um his his spirit uh, that uh, dwells on the inside of each and every one of us that call him our messiah yes you know we need to be ever so careful that we're bearing his name well and that we aren't causing um uh, pain to the spirit because i yeah. just I, I can't imagine that, that's a yes. rejection. I mean, that, that wasn't the question you asked me, but. <laughs> no, no, but, I, but but it is because, you know, when when Paul writes, you know, do not grieve the spirit. And, you know, because he tells um, Timothy in um, 2 Timothy 3.16 that the spirit breathes out the word. Mm-hmm. Every time you hear, especially some of these modern teachers, diluting yeah. the word, word Oh, this is not really what it means. Yeah. Oh, maybe it meant that, you know, two thousand years ago, but doesn't mean that now. Mm-hmm. The spirit is 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 grieved, and like you say, they're really walking on thin ice. Yeah, you know, if you look back at what Yeshua, <laughs> what did he speak about? All those elements that his, that the Father did, starting in Genesis. Mm-hmm. He came and showed how they're relevant for that time and that how the religious structure of the day, forget the political structure of the day, which was Rome dominance over the people, but the religious structure had made a mess in the house. Yes. And Yeshua literally went physically to go clean it out, the clean house. I mean, you can say he went to clean house. Yeah. So to me it's when he raised and elevated the word to its highest expression you see in matthew 5 very clearly Mm -hmm. he says i didn't come to abolish the ways of my father i came to lift them to raise them to their highest expression so who are we if we're calling ourselves his disciples how can we say oh we've come to abolish what jesus was saying and yeah. now we know the right way to live our lives because we know better. I'm sorry, yeah. but it's just not in our scriptures. Yeah. We've we've <laughs> progressed and we've evolved. <laughs> we've come to a higher level. Have we yeah, really? We know we know better now, and yeah. you know it's it's what it's led to, and it's so hard. I mean, I I always joke, you know, nobody goes to more churches than I do, and the things you hear in some places is really pretty shocking. Mm-hmm. But you know, it, we're in the process of making God in our image and saying, well, this is how he is. This is what he really means. And not looking at his word that shows us how he reveals himself, tells us what his nature is, tells us what the plan of salvation is, shows us how Yeshua is the fulfillment of that. And now we say, well, we know better. So it's, it's, it's an exciting time we live in, but it can be very, it can be frustrating and it can be depressing at times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I'll say this, be careful who you image, because if you're not imaging him, you're imaging something else. Yeah. And to me, if you're not imaging him, th- there's coming a day where there there's, 
I don't even see a gray area today. I don't live my life that way. Mm-hmm. I believe it's it's literally that specific. It's either the kingdom of light or the yes. kingdom of darkness. Yes. And if you're trying to find a middle place where you can find a sifting sand or something, you know, yeah. I don't, I don't envy you at all. Uh, I think it's utterly important <laughs> that if if we take on His name, then we're also supposed to take on His character. Yes. And so I would beg the question: If you're acting a certain way, do you did you truly accept Him to be who He is, and are you receiving that? And I'll and I'll put it this way. When uh, a man and a woman come together to get married, the woman is supposed to take on the name of the last name of the husband, right? Because that goes to scripture that mm-hmm. two, yes. two different become one. Mm-hmm. And so what we're seeing is in our life, the two are supposed to become one. So we're supposed to become less like ourselves in our humanistic nature, right. which is sinful and fallen. Mm-hmm. And we're supposed to be more like Jesus, Yeshua, right. yes. who is I. Yes. And he said of himself, I mm-hmm. can only do what I see my father do. I can only say what I hear my father mm-hmm. say. So we know that he emulated and mirrored the father perfectly. If we take on a name, but yet we're going and acting like something else, we're bringing dishonor. I mean, yes. it it would be like me and my wife, we have a covenant relationship. When we got married. That is a binding element that brought us together for the two mm-hmm. become one. Mm-hmm. She takes on my last name. If she goes out and starts acting like um, a Rodriguez, that goes bad on Wilbur. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. But you see what I'm saying? And yeah. I'm not saying that her culture and what she is is, is an important because to me, that's what I love about her, that she's mm-hmm. Hispanic. Her cooking is amazing. Mm-hmm. I love Guatemalan food. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the reasons I really wanted to marry her because she was an amazing cook. And if I said, you know, sweetie, I love you. Uh, you're beautiful, but your culture, it's not really for me. <laughs> uh, I want you to cook me, um, yeah. you know, the Ashkenazi yeah, yeah, dishes yeah. all the time. And that's yeah. all you can do. That would hurt her. Yeah. That wouldn't be two becoming one. And so we have to lay down things that we think are the way to do things go to the source which is scripture you know we have to be be on a solid foundation yeah and then live our life as we're becoming one with him amen well you tell Malky that next time uncle phil comes down he needs a little sample of that guatemalan food (laughs) oh it can be spicy but it's so good (laughs) oh yeah yeah no that's awesome that's really well put i mean the idea of covenant is really well put and before you came on, <clears throat> I was talking about this past Sunday. We streamed a conference here on Messianic Lamb, mm-hmm. and it was basically about the cost of discipleship. It was called Called Out, Being the Body of Mashiach. Mm-hmm. And we had, I don't know, five or six speakers. And so, you know, I gave a talk about the cost of discipleship. Mm-hmm. And just as you were coming on, I was kind of finishing that up by saying, you know, in our time, We've gotten into what I call easy Christianity. We mm-hmm. just want to go on Sunday morning and sing a few songs and listen to a nice message and feel good about everything mm-hmm. and then go out and have brunch and go home. And the idea of being a disciple, which of course has the same root as discipline. Yeah. And then and then the Great Commission, Yeshua says, go and make disciples of all nations. Mm-hmm. He doesn't say, Go out and, you know, once in a while you can talk about me if you feel like it. I mean, no (laughs) pressure on you guys. But, you know, if if you want to mention my name once in a while or, you know, if I come up in conversation, maybe you could just say a little. But no pressure on you guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, No, he says you make disciples. So it has the, you know, in the Greek, as you well, you know better than I do, you know, it has the context of learning and being focused and following and surrendering. Mm -hmm. It isn't just the, you know, what I call high five Jesus on Sunday morning. Hey, <laughs> he's my buddy. And then the rest of the week, uh-huh. you don't give him another thought. Being a disciple is 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 hard work. It's very yeah. structured. And it's, you know, you know, we use the, the, the New Testament uses the word metanoia for repentance. Mm-hmm. 
which means I'm walking in a way, but then I stop and I turn and I start walking in a different direction. Like mm -hmm. when Paul says, I no longer live, you know, the old me is yeah. nailed to the cross. Yeah. And Teshuvah in Hebrew. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so it's a, um, it's a different life. And like you, you, you said it beautifully. I mean, if you take the name of Yeshua, but you're living the same life you always lived, or you live the same life as your non-believing mm -hmm. non-believing friends do. Yeah. That brings dishonor to his name. And as you know, when you study Tanakh and even the New Testament to quite a degree, name is such an important thing mm -hmm. that you call God Hashem the name. Yeah. You call Yeshua salvation. You the, yeah. you know, God is his name, his glories in his name, his powers in his name. He's zealous for his name. He's jealous for his name. You know, names aren't something that are taken lightly. Right. Yeah. So that, that was very well put. Yeah. I, and I'll take it and I'll, I'll um, tack on to what you were speaking of. I, I call it the drive through syndrome. <laughs> You've gotten so used to getting fast food all the time, but how good is it really for you? You know, there's different grade levels of fast food meats it's kind of scary when you look into it and they netflix has done a, a good job of <laughs> getting those stories out as they come but when you want good quality food it takes time you have to go to the butcher you have to pick up the steak or the chicken he chops it exactly the way it's supposed to you bring it home it gets seasoned it gets ready I'm the pop of the house. So I go out, I get the charcoal ready. It takes me over 30 minutes to get my grill ready, prepped, wow. and the fire going. And then the meat goes on it. And I come into the house smelling <laughs> of the aroma of the food. And Malky's in there chopping and she's doing all the side dishes that go along with the meat that, that I've been cooking. And so there, there's this, all this tedious element work. And it's like, is all of it worth it? all of this to get that meal that you really want to enjoy or is it you know what forget about my health forget about spending uh, more money to get the better quality i'm happy just getting a mcdonald's cheeseburger with french fries and a coke and i'll just live on that for the rest of my life that's okay by me when i see that in the scripture where yeshua said i would rather you be hot or cold to me that's what it sparks in my mind Am I in this just so that I can drive through and do, be quick and just, you know, I'll, I'll live my life um, in, a, in a cold manner or something? Or am I willing to do and sacrifice and what it takes to be a disciple? Is that what I want? Because he wants to know that about us. And he says, mm -hmm. you know, there is no middle. He even says there's no middle ground. He yeah. uses Before food temperature to say yeah. that. He says, <clears throat> I would yeah. rather you be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I'm spitting you out. So it's like, oh, so you can't be a cold Christian? I don't know. <laughs> it says, I wish that you'd be hot or cold. But if you're lukewarm, if you're trying to dabble back and forth, he says, I'm spewing out of my mouth. So you see this element of he wants to know, are you hot? Are you for me? Or are you cold? Are you against me? And so I think in our lifestyle that there really can't be, you can't be a cold believer. You have to be one that's sold out. I'm taking on his name. Yeah. And when I take on his name, I'm taking on the responsibility yeah. of what it means to be in this yeah. household. And yeah. I can't look back. I'm shooed. Yeah. I'm turned this direction. Yeah. And nothing can. And that doesn't mean that we don't mess up. Messing up doesn't mean you become lukewarm. Yes. What it means is you pick yourself back up. You say, because we're not Jesus as much as we would like to think we can be that's the goal yes but when we mess up we say father forgive me for i've sinned and through scripture we see it so beautiful i mean who could have messed up worse than peter in the New <laughs> yeah. Covenant, right yes. he denies the lord yeah. three times yes. that's a big no-no yes. i mean forget some of the other things but to deny that you know him to deny yes. his name yeah that is huge and, and yet and, he gets and he forgiven. denies him and he denies him to a servant girl yeah not a soldier not the high priest not somebody who's going to kill him a servant girl 
Yeah. And so I want to encourage you who are watching, like if you say, you know, Nathan, my life has been pretty bad. I don't have something good to emulate. I want to encourage you that mm -hmm. tonight you can turn away from the way of the world. You don't have to live a cold life, Amen. but you don't live a lukewarm one either. There's there's yeah. not a balance of good and evil. It's he yeah. is good. And that's it. Yeah. That is the premium life to live, the good life. It's yeah. going back to Genesis, the, yeah. the, the tree of, of Tov and Ra. And I want to encourage you that you can live this life fully unto him. And just because you messed up, there's still time. You just have to confess before him that you've sinned. And he is faithful yes, and he's just. just to forgive you of all your sin. And yeah. when you turn back to him, he's like that uh, parable where the son that ran away and took all of his inheritance and squandered it all, mm -hmm. his father celebrated the son that squandered everything more than the son gotcha. that had already been. But doesn't yeah. mean he doesn't celebrate us who don't fall yeah. away. But what I'm saying is, is if you've slipped up, come back home because the this two, is a, a the great two things household. I love about that parable is that the father's watching for him to come. Yeah. Watch, sees oh. him from a distance and runs to him. And the second thing is the kid has on smelly clothes. Mm -hmm. He looks terrible. He's been rolling around with pigs. He's got not ugh. kosher. And yeah, not kosher. <laughs> and the father doesn't say to him, now look, you go in the house, you take a shower, you clean yourself up, and then you come into my office and we're gonna have a talk. Well, he puts yeah. the robe right over his mess, mm -hmm. puts the shoes and the ring. The kid just barely gets his confession out, and the father's already putting all the stuff on him. And yeah. that's the good news. You know, so that impacted right. my that impacted <laughs> me, Uncle Phil, in my lifestyle as a parent to mm. realize that you don't have to be the one that inflicts the pain verbally on your children when they know that they've messed up. Now, I believe mm. in correcting wrong behavior because it's mm -hmm. important. But when they acknowledge and turn to you, you you're not supposed to verbally take it out on your children. And you look at that parable that was spoken of so beautifully. We celebrate when our kids come home. We don't go, you were an idiot. What were you yeah. thinking? You took yeah. all the money I gave you and you yeah. squandered it. Oh, my gosh, you're such a loser. Yeah. That's going to do more damage. But the fact that he, the father opened his arms and celebrated and loved on him had a yeah. huge impact for me to make sure that when I am correcting my, my, my children, make sure that I'm doing it with the love that that father showed yeah. his son in returning. And, and going back to Peter, just for a second, before that, I'm, I'm trying to remember the reference, but I can't think of the reference. Yeshua says to him, when you are restored, hmm. you know, you're going to take care of your brothers. So he already yeah. knew he was going to fall. He was going to be restored. And, after, you know, Yeshua never mentions the denials. You know, in John 21, he right. has a talk with them on the beach. And I yeah. always like to think that Peter's by saying, oh, boy, here we go. <laughs> never mentions it. I know. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's it's amazing. <clears throat> yeah. And, and that's what caused, I mean, it's, you see that passion in Peter. He, he was always the first to speak and maybe he messed up and it wasn't the right thing to say, <laughs> or he was the first person to do something and maybe it wasn't always the right thing yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah. But when he repented and that's what I believe, I completely agree with your sentiment in that element. He sees from a distance, mm -hmm. the Messiah mm -hmm. and he just goes all, he jumps. He doesn't care if it, that's right. What it does to yeah. his clothes and his clothing. Yeah. He, he is going all out because he said, you know, I messed up, but regardless, I'm I'm going all out for you. Yeah. And he showed that to the end of his life. That and he the other guys up. are in the boat with all the fish. <laughs> oh, right. And he goes, how right. indecent of him. <laughs> yeah. Preposterous. Well, that's awesome. So tell me what, tell us what you're doing now in terms of your preaching and teaching and what you're involved with and where. So I am part of um, a beautiful exp uh, expression here in, in Jacksonville. I also, you know, I, I work for uh, Celebration Church with Pastor Tim and Pastor Jen Timberlake, and I love them. 
Uh, they're the senior pastors of the church here. And I've, uh, uh, I, I lead a service called First Friday. It's the first mm -hmm. Friday of every month. It's kind of easy to re remember. And mm -hmm. I just love digging into the scriptures and sharing with people the same passion that I have for his word. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage them, the people, yes. to get into this narrative because we are all a part of it. And once yes. we see that, it's beautiful. Yeah. And then, and, uh, and also connected with that, I get invitations that people actually want to hear me speak uh, in other places. And I just can't tell you, Uncle Phil, when, when I'm asked to do it, I just come alive. I mean, you can probably see me right here. I'm like, I'm sitting in my chair, but I'm kind of, <laughs> I will say, uh, if you, I mean, you know me, I, I'm, I'm a very, I'm usually the quiet person. I love enjoy reading books. I would be the guy sitting by a, a, a fire in a, in a cold, you know, it's snowing outside and I'm inside reading a book uh, with my dog at my side and my wife over in the distance reading and <laughs> the children are playing quietly and it's just like, ah. Oh. but uh, when I get to share about his word and about who he is and what, how we should be living our lives unto him, it's just this passion comes out from um, like the depths of my soul yeah. and, and this uh, charismatic person comes out. And so it's, mm -hmm. you know, when I'm yeah. preaching that yeah. has been coming out lately and it's like, yeah. I've even watched myself. Who is that guy? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Who he is. Well, you probably like I've experienced this like almost every week and you probably have too. Sometimes I watch a video of what I did a few days ago. And I don't even remember being like that. I don't even remember saying that. And I say, wow, I don't remember saying that. But, yeah. you know, you, you're preaching in the power of the spirit, mm -hmm. the Ruach, and he's going to take you where he wants you to go. You may yeah. not even realize what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And no, it's... and no matter how many notes you have and how many PowerPoints you have, mm -hmm. you always, something always comes out that you hadn't planned to say. Yeah, and I, I want to encourage everyone here, you know, seek after that the spirit of God at all yeah. costs. And what it means is you're dying to to the sinful nature that tries to separate us from his spirit. Because mm -hmm. when his spirit comes upon us, it's the greatest adventure. Is it the happiest yeah. of times? No. It's I like to call it it's the good there's good times, there's bad times, and there's ugly times. <laughs> <laughs> but he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He takes good care of us, no matter what we're going through, even in the wilderness. I mean, do you think it was a good time with the intense heat and uh, trying to figure out what you're going to eat? But look what he did for them in the wilderness. He was the fire by night to give them yeah. warmth and light and dark and during the darkness. He was a cloud by day yes. that covered them from that intense uh, wilderness sun yeah. that's beating down on them. And then he fed them manna from heaven yes. that sustained them. It was their vitamins, their minerals, the proteins, everything yes. that they needed to sustain. And like, we have to break it up into the, how many food groups, right? Oh, get your yeah. protein, yeah. get yeah. your carb, healthy carb. And, 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 even got, through all, and even through all their rebellions, he provided for them. Yeah. Like every, you know, when you read Torah, I like to say every time you turn the page, there's another rebellion. There's another <laughs> disobedience. There's, let's go back to Egypt. You know, it was so it nice was, over there. <laughs> it was horrible. <laughs> it was, <yeah. laughs> but mean, they still got the manna and they still got the water when they needed it. And oh, yeah. 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 But I, you know, I just can't talk more about when you're being led by his spirit. It's the most beautiful thing that yeah. happens when you. When you come to an impossibility that there is no way something should happen, and my one of the life experiences was just me being here. There's multiple times where it was, I, I was literally one lane away from a horrible car accident. We were just in that lane, and God and the Spirit told my mom to to move over to the next lane. Doesn't make any sense, and then a car just spins mm. out of control we would have been behind that car and been hit. Like it wow. would have been pretty serious, but yet here I am because he sustains me. He he's upholding me. He's protecting me and my household. He's providing all of our needs for, 
um, our, for life and for godliness because he gets great pleasure yes. when his kids do well. It's like yeah. for me as a father, I don't want my, my sons to suffer and not do well. And I'm not going to withhold food from them at the table. That would be unjust mm -hmm. of me as a father. Mm -hmm. So our heavenly father isn't going to do those things. He even knows before we ask, yeah. he's just wanting us to commune with him. And yeah, spend exactly. time with him every day. He wants to hear it from us. He wants, he wants to, hear to have us. an intimate conversation with us. Yeah. We only have about a minute left. Can you believe it? So obviously, <laughs> we're going to have to have you come back. Yeah. You're going to have to pick. Yes. <laughs> you're going to have to pick a time out of your schedule. Oh, happy to. So we could do another hour, maybe in a month or two. We'll but, take a um, consensus. Ask everyone. Ask the yeah. people in your audience. Should we have this wild person back? <laughs> oh, no, no, they will love it. They will. This is a pretty wild network. <laughs> there are a lot of interesting people on this. We oh, just good. had Jeff Seif on the other day. And oh, he's yeah, my he's, he's one of my mentors. <laughs> he's one of my mentors. Seriously, I went to yeah. Christ for the Nations because yes. he was there. Yes. And uh, when I run into a theological discrepancy that I can't equate in my mind i go to him yeah he, he's so good yeah. for a one-liner it's usually yeah. my question is a paragraph and his answer is like a one-liner <laughs> <laughs> well um, nathan we have to wrap it up thanks so much for being here i'm pleasure. sure the audience loved this show and like i'm serious we're going to have you come back thank we'll, you uh, we'll talk you know we'll arrange it privately but sometime in the next month or two Pick Sounds another great. day and we'll do it. But Sounds thanks so good. much for being here. Oh, my pleasure.